Good evening, good evening, and welcome to another episode of the Endless Sales Podcast. Today is Friday, the fifth of April. Always check the date. Always check the date. And um, aye, so uh, our Friday podcast. We've got myself. We've got Stephen. We've got James. Um, so strap yourself in. Hope you're all doing well, and uh, hopefully we can have a, a nice wee podcast. And of course, you know we've got something, something looming on the horizon, which is of course uh, a Glasgow derby. Uh, I feel as if. Like uh, as the, the time gets closer, I feel like a man on death row who's been led to the gallows and he knows that that, that moment of truth is coming. Um, but maybe I'm being too dramatic. Maybe some people are being far more optimistic. I, I just know that the older I get, the nerves get worse. Um, however, we'll put that to the side and we'll just find out how everyone's doing. And first and foremost, welcome to everybody who's tuning in. Hope you are all doing well. Get your comments coming and we will talk about you guys. Um, but aye, Stephen, James. How the hell are you guys doing? You take it away, James. Aye, all good, all good. Just glad to get the week out of the way. Um, I've, I'm walking the motor, so that'll keep me occupied the motor, and then we're on to Sunday, and it's been a long time coming. I've had a absolute stormer of a day. I was telling James before we came on early, my, my boat over to Scotland was cancelled. Had to find an alternative transport, and it was a nighttime boat, and our very own Franny Cardi has decided... Amazingly, they'd pick us up from Carn a five hour journey for him basically all round at night time just to see me and a mate over from, from Ireland for the, the, the game at, at Grace's Bar at Willie's. And look, I can't thank him enough. Absolutely brilliant jester. And it's topped off. Well, that bit of great news has topped off an absolutely woeful day from start to finish. But look, we're here. We're going to talk Celtic and we're going to have a good laugh. And everyone in the comments, like Gavin said, put talking points in. A lot of us didn't have time to do any today, so fire in what you want to talk about and we'll get talking, we'll get chatting and we'll look forward to a Glasgow Derby game on Sunday. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, was there only one boat leaving Craggy Island? Like, was there <laughs> no other alternatives? You're a dick. You're a... <laughs> no, I don't know, man. I've never, I've never heard of a, 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 a ferry operator standing line preempting what a storm may look like. The cancelled two afternoon sailings off the back of basically nothing and it's like i'm i'm loads of money down that put it like this do you know what i mean refunds are needing to be had next week and a few phone calls will be made trust me but <laughs> as for now i'm just looking forward to getting over looking forward to having a laugh with a few of the lads at, at grace's uh greenburn grace's as you should call it and i uh, just buzzing mm -hmm. i used to actually get a ferry to work believe it or not um, so I lived in Renfrew up until very recently, and for a while I worked in Clyde Bank. And uh, when I when I moved to Renfrew, I never knew how I was going to commute. I thought it was going to be like a, a bus into town and then a bus from town up to Clyde Bank. But it turned out there's a Renfrew ferry that would go from Renfrew over to Yoker, crossing the River Clyde. And like the distance it would cross would only be about, I don't know, like... 400 meters maybe at mm. max max you know like uh, a pitiful distance when, whenever you, you think about the river clyde river clyde is tiny anyway but the boat that we had to get every day was it used to be a sheep carrier it was like a, a boat used up north and the, the the northern isles of scotland as a sheep carrier and the company thought they could get away with using a wee sheep carrier to ferry the workers um from us across the River Clyde and I had to get that every day. Whenever I told people in work like I get a ferry to work, like they thought I was just a fucking dick, you know, just take <laughs> this, like, you've got a terrible sense of humor. I'm not gonna fall for that. I'm not I'm not talking to him again. But it's the genuine truth, you know, I used to get a ferry to work. And it's actually it's, got, it's, got, it's, on page. it's got it's on Twitter page, the Renfrew Ferry. Um Do I, you run uh, up? <laughs> we, all to, we all had to check in, you know, and take turns at running and giving the updates. You actually had to check the, the Twitter page in the morning before you're walking to it to see if it was on. And some of the reasons that the ferry would be off would be a high tide. And I remember in the ferry driver telling me about tides and how they work, and it's all about the moon. I never knew that. He says, Did you never learn that in geography? I'm like, Fuck, of course not. Um, so a high tide. You probably and, did. Uh, and uh, what else? What else? Yeah, uh, high winds because that would lead to choppy water. However, the one thing that would never put off the ferry would be the rain, you know, because the rain is just the rain, you know, that doesn't put off boats. Anyway, um, I, I digress. I digress. Um, yeah. So, 
I used to get the ferry tunnel. <laughs> if anybody knows anything about the Renfrew ferry, uh, give it a shout out or, or uh, subscribe to their Twitter page. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so Stephen, when is your um, ETA, your estimated time of arrival? Jesus, mate. I don't want to give me estimated time of arrival. There's people after me. You can't be doing that live in the phone. No, we're joking. I'll be getting into, I'll be getting into um, Corn Ryan probably in around 10 o'clock at night and we'll be driving back to the location that shall not be revealed. And we'll get there about 12 o'clock. So quite interesting times ahead. It sounds like you're like an operative of a cell, you know. Um, do, you have any, <laughs> do you have any traditions whenever you hit the mainland? Any particular things that, that, that you like to do? Like get a pizza crunch, go to, to, to Grace's, as you say. Is there anything particular that you say, if I don't do that, then it's not a proper trip to Glasgow? One thing I don't do is call it the mainland. It's Scotland. <laughs> Ireland, Scotland. No, it's, it's called Scotland. But um, when I go for I, I, I like the... A tradition wise, ah, geez, just get pissed and have a good time. <laughs> That's it. And as long as you have a good time with your mates and having a bit of fun. I mean, last time it was over for the Christmas party, which you guys all will be involved in again, obviously, coming up and even in the summer as well. We're going to get together as a group. But we got beat by hearts that day, and yet we still managed to. Um, <laughs> we still managed to have a brilliant night, brilliant occasion, and we were all steaming and dying the next day. and it, that's the mark of a good night for me with your mates, isn't it? Tradition-wise, I, I do love the bakora you have over there. I think it's different from ours. And, and I know Willie gets it. From, <laughs> I know Willie gets it from this place over in where he lives, and it's class, by the way. But it's far different from we get over back home in Ireland. So bakora, maybe I don't know if that's a good answer, but you know, you know what I mean. <laughs> James, I think you were quite tickled by that. Was it the Pakora comment or was it something else? No, just the Pakora comment. Right? <laughs> yeah. Scottish do, you like, do you not like Pakora? I like Pakora, but I didn't know. I didn't know Scotland was famous for it. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. It must be the way you say it. It's, I guess it gets me hungry, like Pakora. I don't know. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I've kind of went off my door on me. Uh, that's dead to me. It's not. It's, it's never alive in the first place. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's not really proper meat. Go on, on me. Anyway, you like a bit yeah. of meat. Uh, right, okay, so to everybody <laughs> who's tuning in, by the way, <laughs> now, see, Jed have... gets it. Aye, aye, of course. Simple man, simple pleasures, you know. Uh, I don't mean that in a derogatory way, of course. Um, being, being, he wears uh, no pants, it's okay. <laughs> it's, it's what you do, it's what you do over here. Um, yeah, by the way, I never actually say this on the podcast, but to the viewers, uh, anybody who's tuning in and you haven't already subscribed, please subscribe, be a friend, and hit that like button, because we will like that. Um, okay, so, oh, by the way, did anybody watch the, the Man U and Chelsea game last night? That was a fucking disaster. It was like two abysmal teams going at it, and Man U were leading up, leading uh, with the winner right up until the very end, like deep into stoppage time, and then Chelsea equalise, and then Chelsea get the winner. And um, I, I don't know which team is worse. Well, certainly, man, you are higher in the table, I think. But these teams used to be fucking Champions League winners. What's happened? Did any of you watch it last night? It was a, a thoroughly intriguing game. I mean, for me, I, I was knee deep in the Dragon's Den and the Apprentice. That was my first day night. Didn't watch that game one bit. <laughs> I'm honest. Was it a, a Gary Neville episode? I think he's joined the, the Dragon's Den. Is that no, he, he was on it a few weeks back. He was on it a few weeks back. Does he hold his Does own? I asked that when I watched the Liverpool game and then I had a couple of wee bets on that and then I caught the end of the Man United game, but that was like classic Man United these days, wasn't it? Just I, I know when we're going to talk about Celic, but the goal at the end, you could see it a mile away as soon as they took the corner. It was just fucking everybody ran uh, ran off him. And I just classic man you how he's still in a job, I don't know. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. <laughs> The one thing I don't like about Cole Palmer, who scored the winner, he does that shivery. He's like, he's ice cold. You know, I fucking think that's cringe. Absolutely cringe. He's a great player, you know, um, but cringe, cringe uh, celebration. Anyway, 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 anyway. Right, okay, so um, we have got a big game coming up this weekend. Um, did anybody Do watch Brendan Rogers' uh, press conference? Yes. James, what was your takeaway points from that? Uh, without being my 
usual morning self. Uh, good bits and bad bits, to be honest. Um, the the thing we, when he spoke about the the referee, um, when he spoke about John Beaton, um, it was a kind of like a backward step for the position that we held mm. even last week. Um, he was saying that it was only he was only speaking about that one specific game and how he was the most experienced ref. Blah blah blah. Basically, I was going to say stop short. I praised them, but I suppose to an extent he did. Um, whereas I would have liked to have seen him been a bit more bullish in the sense that highlight it is. I don't think he would get a ban for highlighting it. He's merely stating a fact that the two officials that were directly involved with that Hearts game have taken the last two games. Um, and I think I said in the group chat as well when it all came out about. The SFA said that John Beaton was getting full marks for um, his VER decisions that day. Then I felt at that point that was kind of just teeing him up to, to get this game to be the referee. But by that same token, if you're saying that John Beaton's VER decisions, I'm going off on a tangent here, but if you're saying that John Beaton's VER decisions that day were spot on, then surely that means that Don Robertson should have been punished for no getting the decisions initially. And he ended up getting our next game after it. So I I, I wasn't too I say too happy. I wasn't really asked to be honest, but I wouldn't I didn't like that kind of stance that he took. Um and then the other bit and look I'll say it the night as well, um like Sunday I, I think I would take a draw the new. Um maybe that's a wee bit kinda of defeatist to me, but I just think if we I think for Celtic, this is a do not lose game, mm. um, and then obviously the game at Parkhead becomes a must win game. Uh, I think if we turn up and play as we can, we will win. But that has been an issue this season, us getting that kind of consistent level. Um, but when Rogers came out and said, I can't mind the exact quote, but he said um, basically along the lines, it's a game we'd like to win, but we don't need to win it. Hear um, that line. Hear that line. Hear that. Aye. And it's all one for us to say it, but um I if you are like in the kind of dressing room <laughs> well it was a rocket a couple of weeks ago, wasn't it? I was in a rocket a couple of weeks Space ago. Shot. Space Space shot, shot. Yeah. <laughs> um right. but no that that comment uh, coming from your manager, look I I've had my fucking battles on here about Brendan Rogers previously, but one thing you can he hold against them, obviously, is his record against them home and away. Um, exactly. So, obviously, to pick the bones with it is probably a bit harsh, but that was my, my takeaway for it. Fair enough. Fair enough, mate. Fair enough. Good points raised there. Um, Stephen, in terms of the um the psychological warfare going into these games, you know mm. what we know I'm trying to dramatise it tonight as the host. Um, However, whenever uh, Roger spoke about the referee in, in beating, um, uh, he said that these occasions demand the best referees. And he said, well, John Beaton is one of the top referees. I would have liked for him to say, and I expect uh, a top refereeing performance from him as well um, to, to kind of befit the faith, befitting of the faith um, bestowed by the SFA. I would have liked something along those lines. He kind of gave John Beaton a free pass. He kind of skirted mm. over it, is what James alluded to. I felt that that was perhaps a missed opportunity to put some pressure on the referee. Now, I don't think you even need to be paranoid. I'm one of the, the least paranoid Celtic fans, I think, out of um, uh, out of uh, the original Jungle Gems, compared to McGinty anyway. He's, he's a very paranoid chap. And um, I think that... Yeah, I, I would not I would not be surprised if there were some controversial decisions in this particular game. So I thought that that was a missed opportunity from Brendan Rodgers. So what do you think about that particular point about the referee, talking about John Beaton and um, the, the, the wider kind of issues uh, from that uh, presser with Brendan Rodgers? Yeah, I mean, I find it interesting that the two referees we had issues with ended up getting consecutive games, Don Robertson and then John Beaton. When they, when they had issues with Willie Collum, he wasn't seen at Ibrox. I think set in seven months or something along them lines, and he, he's actually a part of the, the, the refereeing team on Sunday. In regards to the comments, yeah, it's, it sounds like a climb down from what like James was alluding to, that, that it seemed like the pressure certainly were putting on the referees in the SFA. It seems like Rogers has climbed away from that. 
is he is he one of the most experienced refs? Probably. Is he one of the best? He's probably probably one of the best out of an absolutely crap bunch. So it's not really any thing to measure a good referee by. I don't know that Tony said it in. Was it passive aggressive? Did it sound like that? Did it sound like he was just saying it the for lip service? It sounded diplomatic. Diplomatic. So you can't even say that. I didn't see the the, the whole press conference today because I just know how they shitstorm of a day. But this the, the refereeing thing is um is is it's that balligan, to be honest. It, that refereeing team that we're up against on Sunday is absolutely pitiful. It's the SFA giving us a big fuck you. That's what that is. Celtic dare to challenge us. Wait and see what we can do in probably the biggest game of the season. And you mentioned controversial decisions. Look, we expect it all the time. And I've seen Tyf- Tyfon, was it McFlustery, talking about that and what Jock Sting said about if you play good football, you don't have to worry about the ref. Even we're talking about the sixties here. This this has been going on for years. Even he knew back then that this is the stuff we have to face. And that, by the way, that statement is true, a hundred percent. If we play to our strengths, I believe we will win. I, I didn't like the comment Roger said about we don't have to win the game. It's like you're trying to fire up your team, not give them an out or give them the excuse if they don't come away with three points. I, I, I did not understand his logic behind that. It's a high pressure game we face. On Sunday, and by the way, let's make no no mistake about it. It's our fault that it's high pressured with the amount of points that we dropped and gave away to them, and the ground that they made up. The, the, the wider scale of it, like obviously the usual about injuries, and I don't want to touch upon that because we'll come on. To obviously, Carl Mac, obviously Gavin later on. I'm, I'm sure on on the podcast to kind of give you space to bring that up. But the, the refereeing thing does it's it's shameful and it baffles me day in day out how bigger. Corporations don't look at this and be like, "There's a problem with the Scottish referee and landscape, the SFA. There's a there's a fundamental issue that needs sorted out from top to bottom." But it seems like anyone who tries to challenge it gets frightened off. Anyone who speaks out about it gets punished. And again, it goes back to that. Apart from one particular team, which I find incredible. And as I said these before, I, I watched that um, other po- uh, podcast with like in that heart and back to the game. We've talked about it a lot. But the numbers are there in graphs, the numbers are there with stats, and they're backed up by property data websites and an- analyzed that are held by certain individuals. And look, it's there for everyone to see. It's a it's a pattern of assistance and it needs called out. And it seems like Rogers was on his ladder today and climbed away from that. Don't know why, but sure. Yeah, yeah. Um well, in terms of the actual press conference itself, I felt that Rogers exuded the presence of someone who's been there and done it and he was unfazed by the questions posed to him and he he seemed outwardly outwardly unfazed by the occasion he said that he's been there a number of times and one of the questions asked him was does your experience um give you give you an edge in these games does it give you confidence and he just said well he he flipped that and he he just said well it's just um that the the players and and um, the way that they're playing, as long as they follow instructions and and things like that, and as long as they're doing well in training, and that's what gives me confidence going into these games. So you never put it. It kind of handled that that kind of that that question well. I felt um, in terms of uh, the injuries, I'm sure a lot of people have been um, kind of you know concerned about this. So Cal McGregor, he will be involved in the squad. Um, there will be a final call tomorrow uh, as to whether he will be uh, starting or not. Um, but um, Brendan Rogers said that apart from Cal McGregor, apart from the, the question mark whether he starts, and he's just simply in the squad, um, everybody's good. Even Palma is back in training. So it's really, really encouraging to know that we're going into this game. Well, if you compare it and contrast it to the opening Glasgow derby, when we played at Ibrox, and it felt like the chips were down. And we had people like Liam Scales and Lagia Bielke at the back, which we never envisaged, and how we kind of came to the fore. Um, it's quite encouraging um, that we have pretty much everybody to choose from, even Rio Hatati coming back into form, who started off the game at Livingston very, very encouragingly. And even Bernardo, who looked like he was out in the cold, came back in and they scored... Uh, a really, really nice goal. Um, so it looks like even his confidence, Bernardo's confidence, Rio Hattati's confidence is up. Obviously, we've got Awata, who, if you're talking about people um, brought in from the cold, Awata's played a, a number of games now. 
So in terms of his confidence in his Celtic career so far, it must be at the highest right now because he's been given faith by Brendan Rodgers. He's not he's not he's not um uh squandered that faith. And so if you're talking about people going in with confidence right now, this might be an all time high. Um I think that the the inconsistencies throughout the season has been there for all to see. But right now, at this moment in time, for the remainder of the season, it looks like whisper it, it looks like we might actually show a bit of consistency now. So, James, the old cliche, um, the forum book goes out in these type of games. Are you reading into that? Uh, do, do you subscribe to that? Or do you think that our form right now and the confidence of certain key players and even some French players might be the difference maker? Some French players? Uh, some French, French players. <laughs> we don't have any French players. <laughs> Is it French or what? <laughs> <laughs> so did I. I was like, who? Hey. <laughs> Big Julian's coming back. Uh, no, oh, I mean, in, in terms of his um, McGregor comments, I found it quite kind of quite telling. He did say, what was it? If he was eighty percent fit, then he would be be playing. To see, to be perfectly honest with you, I think if Callum McGregor can stand these in two feet on Sunday morning, he'll be in the team. Um, I think, in especially in these types of games, he's he's that influential. And look, I, I like Awata, but I, I would I would take an eighty percent fit Callum McGregor um, in Sunday over Awata, even if it's just for the what, first kind of hour or whatever. Hopefully, well. I think I put 27 nothing in the predictor, so hopefully we're 25 nothing up by then, and then we can take McGregor off, get a water on, um, and hopefully at that point it's just a, a case of kind of trying to see the game out. I know that's obviously totally idealistic and it will no, no play out that way, but I, I, I think our team picks itself for Sunday, um, and I think McGregor, McGregor will be in it. In terms of the form book thing, I think Rogers already it as well. Um, was it four wins and a defeat for Bathes in the last five mm. games? But I, I think that's a total myth. See the the form book goes out the windy. Maybe on occasion it does, but by and large it does go with the form. And currently, <laughs> we're, we're both in the the same kind of the same vein of form, really. Um, and the. Uh, sorry, what was I going to say there? Some else about his press conference. Aye, that was that was something that I wasn't really like you're saying when he was referencing the the first game of the season, the first Celtic Rangers game, um, when we had scales and I think fucking me and you were a ball here away from making the bench that day, but it was genuinely like, at that point it was uh, like really fucking he doing us up type thing type. Like, Backs to the wall, just grind it out here. Um, I don't think MD gave us a prayer that day, myself included. I'd have took your horn after a draw at the time. Um, so to have a full squad to pick for, and as I say, we, we are kind of tit for tat in terms of form. I wasn't really buying into the idea that Rangers are the kind of the dominant favourites getting into it. I, I don't, I don't believe that. I think, I think if you're a betting man and a neutral, most people will probably back a draw for this. Um, so I didn't really buy into that, but obviously, hopefully, we can just edge it and get the three points. Mm -hmm. Can I um, pause you guys for a second? Uh, obviously, um, with my mispronunciation of French, it sounded French. Uh, some people are talking about um, French things. What's your favourite French football export, if I was to take out Zidane? And I'll take out Thierry Henry as well. What for France? Like a player, you mean, or a France thing? Uh yeah. Well, <laughs> you, can, you can have two. You can have two choices: a football thing and just a French thing. I do love a pastry. I love a. I love a croissant. Like, hundred percent. Did um, you know that croissants aren't actually from France? I believe that they're from Austria, and the reason is, is it is in that crescent, and it was the. I think it was a. Was it the? There was a war for back in the day, and the crescent was as a as an insult to the Ottoman Empire, which were a Muslim empire. And the crescent, you know, like a lot of Muslim flags have that crescent, and the croissant was a, as an insult to the Ottoman Empire with the, the the thing, and so they made a pastry of it. I think it was um um the Austrian Hungarian Empire who beat the Ottoman Empire in a war many many years ago, and everybody thinks it's French, but it's really Austrian. 
Yeah, you kind sorry. of fucked me there like that. You? You've, you've kind of fucked me big time. Like, so Stephen, what um, do you think about that? <laughs> <laughs> our political correspondent from Austria, thank you. Um, I, I think that for French footballers, I mean, Mbappe, I like watching him play. <laughs> and, who else? I'm saying who else. That's totally disrespectful. My, my mind's going blank when I'm trying to think of France players. By the way, so um, Celtic, Celtic played... PSG back in the 90s, Tommy Burns, um, time, and we get beat 3 0 by PSG at Parkhead. Jorkaev ran the show, uh, and that was before he went to, to Inter Milan. Fantastic player, brilliant, brilliant player. Good answer. You got, any, you got any ideas, James? I always like back in the day, I always liked David Trezeguet and mind the full oh, back. Uh, yeah. Was it Bic- Bixentine or Bixatine? Lisa Razu. The fucking aye, coolest aye. name in football at the time. Lisa Arazu. Aye, pull back, aye, aye. He was good. Aye, he was good. Are custard, are custard, are custard tarts French? <laughs> no? I don't know. You know. It's know. asking. Uh, you know I'm just waiting to give you, know you your history of the custard tart, though. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know her? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know her? Do you know her? On this day, on this day. <laughs> Tell you about the custard tarts. Um, right, okay. Aye, so... Um, what were we talking about before before uh, that? What were we talking about before the, the, the French injuries and Calmac and French nightlife? Mm-hmm. I I love a, a garlic baguette. Um, um, is that nice. France? Is that not a? Is that France? Oh, well, just garlic is associated with France, you know. Oh. What's and, French for baguette? And and, and Vincent Cassel, <laughs> uh, a great actor. Um, right, okay, back to Celtic, back to Celtic. Right, okay, well, so one other thing I, I want you to ask. So we've got... Hold, Greg, hold, 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 hold on a wee second. I want to piggyback off what James said, because I thought he made some interesting points about the croissant, no, about Carl McGregor <laughs> and, and, and things. <clears throat> See, for me, I'm a totally of the opposite thinking of James. If Carl McGregor is a fully fit, I'm not playing him. And the, the reason... The reason I think anyway, I think Watt has played well in that number six position. I think he does what he says in the 10. He's a number six. He can break up the play and he gives it to the better players. It, does he need to speed up? 100%. I, I believe so. But I would keep him in the team. I, I look at even Rio Atate. It gives me the fear a wee bit. And yeah, we're all happy he's back. But this is a cauldron we're going into here. You need fit players on the pitch. And it, it is for me between Calmack and Rio to get the nod. And I wouldn't have two players on the pitch who aren't 100%. Because for me, you need energy. You need legs, athleticism. You need closing down. You need the high press. And O'Reilly's not going to be dropped, let's be honest. So you're looking, for me, O'Reilly, Hatate. No, Hatate. O'Reilly, Iwata, plus one, in my, in my opinion. But see, mm-hmm. this is something... Well, that might sound like a pure dafty here, but what is match fit? Everybody always says match fit. What does match fit mean? There isn't a definition for match fit. In my opinion, you're either fit to play or you're not. No, I don't get. I don't think so. I don't. Your decision making becomes quicker when you're match fit. Your your eye for a pass. I think it, the way you but, close uh, down space. Yeah, but if, if, it's happens, happens, that, if there's a if difference between fitness and match fitness, it's it's how your it, it's it's like almost like your your brain working with your body, whereas your body yeah. might be firing on all cylinders, but yeah. Do you get me? I think Stephen understands that. that the alertness. If, if, if Hitati's played a bounce game during the break and then played against Livingston last week, is that not a kind of cop out to say that he has no fit? But he's, if he's, he's played basically two. That's why I'm saying. Game. That's why I'm saying it's one or the other. I, I just don't think we should be going to Ibrox with two players who aren't a hundred percent. I know there's no such thing as a hundred percent, right? But. You're talking about playing Cal McGregor if he's eighty percent. Doesn't sit well with me to be honest. Do you know what I mean? It it, that, that was what Roger said. To be fair as well. Um, no, I, no, I get that. I get that. Yeah. The guy asked him. He says if he's kind of seventy, eighty percent, has he got that quality and the experience uh, to carry him through? And he pretty much said if he was eighty percent fit, he'd be, he'd be in the team. Um, but look, look I, I know. I understand what you're saying. I, I, I obviously, I, I get it. I'm been a wee bit kind of flippant with that there, but for me, that look, look, we've said a hundred times, McGregor's played fucking about six hundred games a season for the last X amount of years. Mm. 
and we we keep saying that he needs a rest and look, I know he was injured, so it's no arrest as such. But if he's played fucking four hundred games getting into a game, I'm, I, surely that's detrimental as well. Do you know what I mean? Like, would you rather coming in, in relatively fresh, no having as I say, rested, he's no rested, I understand he was injured, but I, I don't know, I just think, if he's fit enough for the bench, then it has to start for me, and yeah. I, I get, I understand your your points, I, I get what you're saying, like, getting back to playing consistently, but you've got to start somewhere, and he's the captain, and he's been absolutely, well, especially the last game at Park he was absolutely brilliant, so for Would me, you start both of them then? Would you start I, Rio and Kalmak? I, I, honest to God, I think the team picks itself, and I think the midfield three is O'Reilly, Hitati, and McGregor. If McGregor pulls up or whatever happens, I know he said he'd be assessing him the more as well. But honestly, I think if McGregor can stand these end two feet and Sunday will be in the team, I, I think he's that influential in these games. Can I can I ask James? Um, in fact, perhaps I might put this over one to, to Stephen actually. Say, for example, Cal McGregor doesn't start the game, okay? Um, how do we compensate for his biggest asset, which I think is his in-game intelligence? I don't think anybody else can rival him for that. Um, his streetwise nature, whenever you need to slow the game down, whenever you need to uh, speed things up. Um, there has been games uh, last season, um, I remember, when um, McGregor forced... Uh, a goal at Ibrox when he just drove into the heart of the, the midfield, got into the, the, the defence. And it was just like, uh, he just knew that this was the time to, to, to make things happen. And I, I think that McGregor, for his experience, and is, as I said, street by his nature, I don't think anyone comes close to, to him in our squad for that. Obviously, heart is a different thing, but heart can't affect the game from where he is. Kamikata Vickers has got great intelligence, I think. But, the way that the position of McGregor, um, I, I don't think his peers uh, possess that. So if McGregor doesn't stop, how do we get around that? How does that affect the game if we don't have that street cred on the, on the, the pitch? Well, we didn't think we could compensate for losing um, CCV in the first game with larger belt and scales. We managed to come away with a victory. So there's, I mean, there's instances where we've done it before in the past. And look, McGregor is a fantastic football player. Don't get me wrong. He's dominated the last uh, couple of Derby games he's been in. And that's why I'm saying, for me, it's down to two. It's it's down to the two of them. It's either Rio or Kalmak. It, it can't be both. How do we compensate? And I look at Awada. I think his defensive qualities in terms of shutting players down and getting the ball back quickly is probably up there with McGregor. I think he probably puts more tackles in and he covers the ground really quickly as well. He's athletic that way and he's, he's robust. So you've got that kind of in the number six, a natural number six that we've always talked about. You've got Matt O'Reilly, who brings the elegant side of things, the passing, the kind of moves with the Coon, whoever starts on the right, and Kyogo, if he starts up front. You've got that there. And then you've got Rio or Kalmak in there as well. So Rio would bring the dynamism, the kind of exploding on the front foot, trying to get forward all the time. So there is ways we can compensate for it. Cal McGregor is an extremely important, integral part of the team, 100%. But you, you mentioned it as well. If he picks up a niggle and he's out for the running, then people be going, why did you play him? But then you can count that and say, if we get beat and he's on the bench, why did you not play him then? So it's a 50-50. I understand people's arguments. I'm coming across this from a purely fitness aspect of it. And look, I'm not doubting the quality he brings for a second. I love Callum McGregor. I'm just questioning the legs in midfield, questioning can two players who've been out for a sustained amount of time cope with that type of environment. You have to press constantly. You have to hurry constantly. You have to win the ball back constantly. And look, I, I know McGregor's done that, but this is a McGregor coming off the back of a, not major injury, but a minor injury. So you don't know how he's going to react. I know Rogers has said he has until tomorrow. They kind of nail down his place. Which gives me confidence that he is kind of climbing that and he is fit, but it's just that it's either one or one or the other. I think we need the legs in there. We need to be able to cover the ground really quickly, and that, that's where I'm coming across this from. And we've got a comment in from Jed. Uh, Awata was poor in the recent game against Hearts, and I worry he'll be able to cope with the hostile atmosphere on Sunday. Um, <coughs> that's a, a, a decent point as well. Um, so I, I guess we will eventually get. Does it, to, doesn't to, Gavin? Does it? Doesn't oh. that concern you? So like, the, the, do you not understand where I'm coming from? So it's the pure and other just that's some ninety minutes of bang, 
Do you know what I'm saying? That yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, well, do that. Let, let, let me say one thing, okay? I know we want to get, in it, get into the lineup um, at some point during the podcast, but I would definitely start Hitati because I think what he offers, nobody else offers that in our squad. Um, I think that O'Reilly has been um, industrious but lacking in uh, creativity in recent weeks, and I think Hitati is your man for that. Whenever Hitati started at Livingston, he immediately assumed responsibility for chief creator, and he, he just took it to, took to it again like a duck to water. Um, so I would start Hitati, but I do expect Hitati to start flagging at some point past the hour mark, maybe with 20 minutes to go. And yeah, that is a worry. Cal McGregor, though, my my worry about starting him is that, see, whenever they man-mark Cal McGregor, if yep. Cal McGregor starts tomorrow, he's going to play, in, obviously, in the number six. And the, if they do have the intelligence to man-mark him, which I expect them to do, then if he's not fully fit, he will struggle to make himself effective. He struggles enough as it is to make himself effective when he gets man-marked at iBooks. But add in that complication of him not being fit, 100% fit, not even match fit, fit, that will make it very, very difficult for him. So I've got a concern with that. Um, that could really, really nullify our effectiveness at bringing the ball out from the back. And then... You have to think, well, maybe Cal McGregor needs to be on the bench if he's not going to be um hundred percent fit. So that that that's my concern. If 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 he's if he's like firing in all cylinders in training, then yeah, I'll start the both of them and take that risk. I think we need to go for the jugular. That's the strategy mm. I would go for. I don't think we can play within ourselves. I don't think we can be conservative. We need to go for the jugular. However, there is a massive risk starting McGregor if he's not fit. James? See the McGregor thing, and I get this is slightly different, obviously it's different injuries, but see the last time McGregor was out for any kind of length of time, it was when he came back with the, the mask on, it was his first game back, no, the 3 nothing game at Parkhead against him, and he absolutely bossed it that night, I'm sure that was the night with the shite bag shout to Barisic, you know that, yeah, and he absolutely that day, yeah. bossed it that night, so I understand it's, it was nearly like his legs or his calf or whatever it was, it was injured, it was a facial injury, it's a bit different, but he was still out for a kind of prolonged period of time and he, he came back into it and was Hattati was man of the match that night, obviously, but he, he was still really, really good that night. So I think he's got history for it. And like, what we're saying, I get what Stephen's saying about McGregor or Hattati because they're both coming back half long layoffs, but like, Hattati last week was Hattati's kind of rehearsal. If he pulled up or there was any issues with him that would raise question marks, then I 100% then maybe look at Bernardo or that or whoever else. But he didn't come through it and he was really, really good. So he's nailed on to start for me. And then the only issue there is McGregor. And for me, the draft path for McGregor, and what I've already said, I like Iwata. Um, no so much a fan of Bernardo, and we've not really seen a lot at home. But for me, the draft path for McGregor to even Iwata, it's, it's far too much. And if uh, that's why I just think if we were going. If it was maybe McGregor to Hitati, then fair enough, I can get the point. But for me, Hitati and O'Reilly are nailed on to start. So it's going to be McGregor or Awata. And all day long for me, it has to be McGregor if there's any chance yet. Start with your strongest, yeah? Aye, 100%. And you've got Bernardo who can come off the bench. Yep. He's done it already. Well, he, he, he's, he's played in these games. He's he's, he's made his mark. Um. So he's one who can influence the game. Awad is one that can shore up the game if need be. Um, I would imagine that look, it's going to be a frantic, frantic game. Let's let's uh, let's kind of recognise the nature of these games. It will be frantic. Um, Stephen, one thing will be. That, can I be honest? I've not watched Rangers since um, Clement took over. All I know is the results, which have been obviously impressive. Um, they've picked up the points, they've, they've, they've pegged his back in that regard. Um, sorry for using the word peg. Um, but James picked, he perked up there. He was like, what? Still. I, I've genuinely not watched their style of play. Um, I know that they've got a couple of new recruits as well. Um, so I don't know their game plan. Um, one thing I said, I think they will man-mark McGregor if he starts. The other thing is the, the pressing. Um, so have you... Have you been paying attention to Rangers at all? Another thing, as I said, you know, um, the, the playing out from the back, um, I think that we will continue to do that. We're not going to change that. We're going to. We're, I don't think we're going to lump up the park unless need be. Um, 
So presumably we're going to have um, Scales, Cameron Carl Vickers, uh, Taylor at left back, and mm. Alistair Johnson at right back, which is reassuring of our strongest uh, back four, back five, if you include Joe Hart. How do you think the defensive side will, 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 will cope in terms of starting the play? Well, well I mean... Oh, Jim, sorry, sorry, mate. Sorry, mate. On you go, on you go. No, take it. No, no. I was just going to say... Yeah, are you drinking? Are you drinking tonight? Water? You ever, you tried this? Oh, fuck it. Iron brew. Raspberry Ripple. Ripple iron brew. Uh, That's fucking, disgusting. Just like the show, that. It's fucking weird, man. But no, what I was going to say is... Um, when Ross and Ali McCoy they obviously share a season book for Ibrook, so I've I've had that season book um, a couple of times. So I've seen them a, a couple of times this season. Um, so, but I, I think I don't actually think much in terms of the way they play. The, the way they play has changed. Do they tend to still go for the long ball now and again? And like you say, the the back four kind of picks itself, and they are like it a lump it, you can let that defend Taylor and Scales, but that's who's going to be targeted. Um, mm-hmm. and Aye, the, to be fair, the left side, the left side uh, will definitely be targeted, yeah. Uh, and they've been targeted all season, so look, we've all had questions of our Scales at some point or another, fair bit, maybe a wee bit more recently, but I just think that that's going to be targeted. He stood up to it the first game, so hopefully he can stand up to it again. For me, that if I'm being totally honest, I think that's where the game will maybe be won or lost, depending on how Scales and Taylor perform. I think there is going to be goals in it, so if Scales puts in a performance like he did, and hopefully Greg Taylor puts in a performance like he did when Andrew was here, then I, I, I do think that we'll have a really good chance of getting the three points, but if they two are poor, look, they're up against like, that guy, uh, Dessers, and look, I know he's a, an absolute donkey and he misses chances, but any time I've seen them, he always gets chances. Even at Park, he done. We missed a couple of absolute nailed on sitters against us, the one and one with Joe Hart. But he always seems to get the chances. So if scales and oh, I think... is he? No. Is he dead? James is stalled. James has stalled. Uh, uh, Stephen, how, yeah, how vulnerable are we? Been. Um, we're going to give James a couple of seconds to see if he can recalibrate. Otherwise, he's going to have to get plugged back into the matrix. Um, Stephen, how vulnerable are we down to our left flank? Obviously, with Maida, who surely is nailed on to kind of nullify Tavernier, um, how 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 far does that go to shore up things on our left flank? Well, I mean... <laughs> The left flank, Taylor and Meda on that side, is always vulnerable. But I think Meda does a great job in another fan, um, James Tavenier, uh, for for Lemons. Um, because, let's, let's face it, Tavenier's a League One player at best. And Meda look, makes him look like that instead of this Hall of Famer they, they proclaim he is. In, in terms of the actual setup of Rangers, I don't think much has actually probably changed. I, I think... They are very direct. They're they are very as, as James rightly said, they're Australians of the doctor said it, they're a very long ball type team and they always do the same boring fucking cross balls every time you watch them. And yeah, I've watched them a few times and their game plan. I, I like I like that well, I like the look at Diamande in, in the team. I think he looks a, a good find and signed him in the January window. And I think Barris is back in. I think Yilmaz might be injured, so that's a plus for us because Barris is it's, it's absolutely honking. And if you if you look through their team, I, I know Seema's back, but I don't know if he's fit to start. Um, yeah, a hundred percent. And I, I think as well, McCausen, he's not great. Scott Wright, he's not great either. They're talking about him like he's a legend over there, and he was going to Turkey two months ago. So that they've got problems of their own. Do you know I mean, I think what what Clem, Clementine's done, he's probably made them more harder to beat, more of more of a unit. In, in terms of how to play instead of disjointed under under Michael Beale. But for us, I think we've got the far better footballing team. I think we're more technical. We've got speed at the top end of the pitch. I think Jed said it earlier in, in, in the podcast in the comments. Kuhn, I think he's quick. Kyogo's quick. Mead is quick. So we can take advantage of that because we know they're going to come out as well. So we've got space in behind. Uh, the, the, the defensive areas... Scales and Taylor, look, they are the weak links. That make no mistake about it. But 
scales. Fucking hell, that uh, had a guy rubbing off on it. <laughs> Make no mistake about it. <laughs> <laughs> wow subconsciously i thought of that no but scales i think played well before um <laughs> i just got called duncan from played one there by stephen kennedy he kind of caught me eye <laughs> <laughs> but um scales play, played well before in the game taylor and we we know what we get from him but me out of cover says the in in these games like i said it before if we played at our strengths we'll win I think we'll win comfortably as well, to be honest. It's just, it's, I don't know. We, we need to stand up and be counted. This is our make or break game, to be honest. Yeah. And we, we, need to, we need to fucking play from the start. Can I put one bone with what you say? See, whenever, and uh, you raise a lot of good points. Um, see the, the phrase, we will win comfortably if we play to our strengths. In all the games that we've played them over the past, what, two and a half years? Like, the mm-hmm. majority of them, um, apart from 3 0 at Parkhead, the 3 0 defeat at Parkhead, fucking hell. Um, well, the majority of the games for Celtic victories, they're always a one goal margin. I think that they're always, always tight games. Even if we are comfortable for the majority of the game, we still let them in. Even that one, uh, the, 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 the last one at Parkhead, what was it? Was it 2 1? Tavernier scored a penalty. Ah, uh, sorry, a a a a free kick. He had a he had one free kick which he skied over the bar, and then the next free kick he put it in the in the, the top corner in the postage stamp. And um, you you just know that it's coming with Tavernier. And again, like I think for a lot of these games, we are the better team for the majority of the game. You can't always. I'm be trying to be positive. No, no, I, I I totally get that. I totally get that, but. I think some people get carried away with our superiority, our technical superiority. We need to understand that Rangers have a superior a superiority over us, and that's physicality. They're a bigger team, yeah. and sometimes they can be faster than us as well. I know that on the wings we are we are we're good now with Kuhn and and, uh, and Maida, um, but I think our physicality at times is really really lacking, and. We need our technical superiority in order to to, to to overcome that. And even for for a lot of these games, it's only a one goal margin that we win them. And sometimes we can really be hanging on at the very end, and um, because it kind of it, it swings both ways. Gal, um, hi. See, see, kind of going off your point. Like, if I'm honest, that the only player that worries me is a borderline word here would be Sima. I thought before he injured, before he got injured, he, he looked quality for them to be honest and every bit of the transfer fee that Brighton actually paid for him I think he is back in contention for a starting place he is a good player for honest here the, the rest of their team yeah they're physical but they're let's be fair as well they're battle jobs do you know what I mean they, they've been in this stage of the season before and the field numerous times apart from one season which was a write-off because it was an absolute shambles of a season from our point of view yeah, the physicality worries me, but we've dealt with it in the previous games. And I, and I know what you're saying in terms of the being comfortable. Look, at, that was a loose kind of term to use there. What I'm meaning is a 1-2-1 one, one victory, but we're comfortable within the game in terms of keeping the ball, keeping the pressure on them, being higher up the pitch. I think you can always look at physicality. It's different in Champions League, right? That's a different conversation. But I think the physical players the Rangers have lack quality on the ball. Where we thrive is having, having the ball and being quick in and around tight spaces. And they turn like tree trunks, the majority of them. Do you know what I mean? Turn like milk. So if you've got Kyogo on the edge of Goldson, he's winning that race. If you've got Kuhn on the edge of, it would be Barisic, he's winning that race. And then Mieta terrifies Tavernier. So what they have physicality-wise, we should be able to combat, combat that by playing good football and playing quick football. Now that concerns me because the previous games we've witnessed were taken three, four, five touches from the back. You mentioned the great point about uh, Scales, um, about me worried about the back line. He takes sometimes four, five, six touches before he releases the ball. He can't do that in this game. It needs to be in the feet, straight out in the play again. And it needs to continue that gap for the whole 90 minutes. We cannot be taking our time. I've seen people mention that about Iwata. He dilly-dallies, and I do agree he has done that sometimes. So if he starts, he needs to play the ball quick and get it out of his feet. All the players need to do that. The physicality issue only only really concerns me when it's set pieces because we're vulnerable in set pieces and that's where they thrive on. 
again. Do you know what I mean? Set pieces and penalty kicks. <laughs> yeah. Can I can I ask one thing about that? Uh, thank you for bringing up the, the, the set pieces. Now, they will get a free kick at some point outside our box. What can Joe Hart do to prevent history repeating itself? Because he knows where it's going to go. We know where it's going to go. But Joe Hart just takes his fucking time to get there. And Tavernier is normally kind of put it past Hart before he, he, he arrives to the, the, the top corner. Um, uh, James, do you do you fear uh, a free kick on the edge of the box? And is there anything we can do to nullify it? I, I mean, no game fucking three quarters of the goal to aim at. Um, what he did at Park Heath is the honest answer. And I, th- I think, I don't know if we were on here at that point or whatever, but everybody sitting at the game and look, it started off as a joke and they like, no, I actually did it because everybody thought it was coming. Stick somebody on the post and obviously it's that side that scores. And they understand it sounds daft and you're playing everybody on side, but if you're going to prevent a goal, then just do it. Um, but nah, I mean, look, you've got to be be honest. The guys, the guys, good at free kicks. But look, what you're saying about physicality and things like that, and I get obviously at uh, set pieces that that is massive and it is a kind of weak point for us. But we come up against teams week in week out that are more physical than us, yeah. and look, we by and large win the games. We don't really have any massive issues. Um, I mean, Livingston last week's probably the most physical side in the league. And we squished it. Look, Livingston are a terrible team. I'm not comparing them to them. But you get my point in terms of the physicality. Uh, the, the only thing that I think we're missing in terms of physicality, and I think it's something we've all said at one point or another, is just a big midfielder that will kick in and that moves. It's something that we've not had for years, and it's something that the best teams in the world have got. Um, and I think it's something, especially to kick on in Europe, it's something that we need. But for me, if, if both teams turn up and play at their best, there's only one winner for me, and that's us. We're the, the better fit by team. We've proved it time and time again. It's just our issue this season has been actually turning up and getting that level of consistency. But if on Sunday we both turn up, and Rodgers' history in these games, he does turn up, then I think we should be fine. Now, talking about Brendan Rodgers, uh, he will actually be in the dugout for this one, uh, which we were ov- obviously uh, very pleased with. Um, so, can I, and Brendan, we trust. I think that when the chips are down, Brendan does kind of rise to the, the fore. Um, I think that Brendan has a lot to play in this game. Um, Stephen, I wanted to ask you, in terms of his in-game management, his substitutions, um, even before the substitutions, um, been able to kind of set out the team, um, give the instructions. How important is his experience in these games? And especially going to Ibrox, where there will be just a, a full home support of Orcs. How, how pivotal <laughs> and how important is that? That makes me laugh, Orcs. What, what does that mean again? What's that? Uh, like? it, well, you had Orcs and you had Goblins and the uh, Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit, you know. Uh, they're, they're like not human, they're ugly, they're smelly. <laughs> right, they're, okay, they're right, okay, up. okay. I get it, I get it. Um, I, I think in, in terms of the um Roger's experience like we all know he's been here and done it before and he's done it again this season twice and obviously everything was against him injury wise and not having the, the full team available this time around we'll have most of our key players available which is a good thing get into this game gives us an extra confidence and a, and a momentum boost as well to be fair but in, in terms of experience yeah I think it was what 12 out of the 15 he's won I think, I believe anyway, some that record anyway, it's a good record. Um, he'll be cool, calm and collected like he always is. If he's given a team talk to the lads, like, I know it's a tight game, but we don't need to win it. That, that, that shit needs parked. He needs to be in that dressing room, absolutely railing these guys up to go out onto this pitch and, and play their heart out and play for the jersey and play for us supporters. He'll be watching in their tens of millions around the world as well. Felt a bit like the WWE there when Triple H, are you ready? No, but... um. And no one gets that reference to stone faces, crazy. But I get it, James. I, James you get James it, yeah. Faces, don't you? James doesn't understand, but yeah, his experience counts counts for a whole lot. And I, look, for these games, we have to trust in him. His records are to prove it. And his in-game management has been left for me a lot to be desired this season. He was so decisive at it his first time around. I think this time around, maybe because of the players available to him, he hasn't quite made the same in, impact. The players come off the benches or made the right calls in certain matches, but 
look, we'll have to park that to one side. And I think, I think Monty's right. Look, look forward to this game. Be excited and look with a, a positive frame of mind. And that's where I'm sitting at at the moment. You know me. I, I'm kind of off the handle and react emotionally. But I'm trying not to. I'm trying to have a level head and be calm about this going into Sunday. And I do trust Rodgers for, for these games 100%. Yeah, I think like if there's... A storm, you know that the Brendan is the, the 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 one to rally around. Um, he's done it before, and he will do it again. Hopefully, hopefully this weekend. Um, so I'm hoping for experience, and uh, we've got a dad joke here. What do you call a monkey with a grenade? That ba boom. It's not bad. I've heard better. I've heard worse. Um, give me one. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. Uh, James. Uh, one other thing. Um, going into this game. So we've got seven games left. This will be the, the final game before the split. Correct me if I'm wrong. And obviously we do have the return uh, game at Parkhead. Now, people are getting away with... Some people are getting carried away with this being a title decider. In your opinion, how conclusive is this game if it's a win for either side? I think if they win on Sunday, if I'm being totally honest, for me, the league's done. I know we've still got another game against them to go, but if, if they win on Sunday, it's finished for me. If we win on Sunday and they win their game in hand, there's still only a point in it, but obviously the momentum swings to us massively and it makes us favourites. Yep. So I'm not going to say that if we win it, then we've won the league because th- there is only a point in it if that's the scenario. Um, so, no, I don't subscribe to that if, if we get a win. But if we just don't lose on Sunday, that's what I want. If we lose on Sunday, then for me the the league's done and dusted. Um so just avoid defeat on Sunday and we'll be favourites. So the, the the permutations of it, so we are what one point behind, but they've got a game in hand. So say they win their game in hand, they're two points ahead. But if they win the game um that th- this weekend, then obviously we are playing catch up. So even if we win a parkhead they're still, they're still ahead. Aye, so we so need they, them to drop points. Aye, they play on the Sunday and then they, so, aye, so they play Sunday, then they play on Wednesday. So if they if they win both those games, they'll be five points ahead. If we beat them and they win on Sunday, we'll be a point ahead. Uh, excuse me, if we beat them on Sunday and they win on Wednesday, then we'll be one point ahead. So if they win and go five clear, it's done and dusted. If we win, then we'll be favourites. The momentum totally swings to us. Um, and it, it makes the game at Parkhead absolutely massive, bigger than this game. A barnstormer, as uh, JR would say in the, the WWF, Stephen, yes? Um, and uh, WWF, no. A slobber knocker, is that what you would say? WWF. Slobber knocker, that's a, that's a good one, yeah. It's got to be a slobber knocker. Oh, my God. Oh, Jesus. AJ turned up the podcast tonight. Who was your favourite wrestler in your day? Shawn Michaels. Shawn Michaels. Well, actually, my favourite my favorite thing about the WWE when I was growing up was DX. DX. Yeah, DX absolutely. were incredible. Unbelievable. I remember getting their DVD, and I think it was 2005, 2006, and young kid watching it. It was immense. It was unbelievable. Like, some of the stuff they got up to was nuts, by the way. You wouldn't get away with it and, that that's that a TV kind of day and age. Yeah, Cactus Jack. I, I think it, for me, like WWE, see when they went PG, you know, it just ruined it. Ruined it. And then other people got switched on from it. And same, to I, be I fair. I kind of checked out, like after The Rock and Stone Cold, after at that point, I kind of checked out. It was just kind of like my age groups, like you just started doing other things. Um, But. I did love and all that. Um, at DX. Did you ever have a thing for China since you were in the DX? No. I was going to say something back there, but I'm going to keep it to myself. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, I Blue Mini. Blue Mini was a Seth Cool fan. WWF is shite. Um, Fair enough. Fair enough. Right, okay. Um, so, Stephen, in terms of um, how conclusive will this game be? For a win for either side. The other thing that, that, that I'm still, I'm not being a shite bag about it, but I actually playing Hearts in the the, the remaining games because even if we were to win this game, do you have faith that we could win our remaining games? 
and just like carry it home. Do you think there's jeopardy you know, in the remaining games for Celtic, even if I were to win at Ibrox? You can almost guarantee he, Stephen Naismith would get the biggest gift box from Rangers if we, we drop points against them. Do you know what I mean? Like the done with uh, Terry Butcher all them years ago. Absolute shambles that they are. But um, if, the, if we lose against them on Sunday, the league's done. We'll have to be comfortable with that thought. This is our do or die. No draw. We're there, there to win. We're there to win the game. Will they take a draw as a secondary? Yes, but would it be raging? Absolutely. I'd be fucking furious if we draw the game. We need to go there and win. The players should be fired up to do that. In regards to the remaining games, I always cast my mind back to that time when Pasta called new first came in. We lost three and six, and we pretty much had to go that rest of that season unblemished. That gives me confidence again, albeit slightly different personnel, that we could do it with the remaining players like McGregor, Joe Hart, and Fickers who've been over the course to do that. The, the remaining games to take care of themselves because the player, players know what's on the line, and it's not even that as well. It's Champions League football. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's Champions League football. Typhon Mc, McFlustery, fuck up, Stephen, never say never. I'm agree, I'm agree with you. I want us to win. I want us to win the game. I don't understand. But I'd be raising up a draw. But if 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 we if we lose, it's it's done. Five points is a big deficit. I think we'll beat them at Parkhead, no problem. But it's the it's the the other games. I think they'll probably win with with dodgy decisions and things going their way. They probably shouldn't. A beats ball will count as a goal. Someone sack will fall off. They'll get a penalty kick. You know, you know how it is. It's crazy. It, it's everything will fall in their favour if they win. Have you ever encountered a typhoon crossing the Irish Sea? I'll be encountering one tomorrow. Boken. Mm -hmm. Having the beer, that's what they'll be doing. Causing causing a typhoon in the Irish Sea. Aye. Um right, okay. Uh so JD, of course, there's risk after this. We we've lost points against a few of the other top six sides this season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally I totally agree, mate. I totally agree. Um nothing is sure, you know, even if we win at Ibrox, you know, it's not a, a it's not a sign seal delivered. Um Fuck Gav, don't start it tonight with a wait, postman I, I, pattern. I, I, you did it on purpose. You did it on purpose. <laughs> I, We're I not going there tonight. To I swear to God, I wasn't thinking about... You looked at me. Way. You did a wee look across to me and went saying, feeling delivered. No chance. I also said earlier that Tavernier's free kick was right in the postage stamp. I think I was really one of the things before it. Wow. <laughs> that was the other thing. Yes. No. Incredible. I'm not, I'm not trying to bring you back into this. I'm not trying to bring you back into this. I was never a postman or collected stamps. I'm putting that out there again. Never. Stephen, it's a noble, a noble hobby, which stretches back <laughs> more, more than a century. Fuck you, oh, God. Sorry, sorry. Sorry. No, look, okay, we are going to stop for a second and we're going to do a quiz. A quiz which okay. I know. I might make this up on my feet as we go or on my, my, my seat as we go. What did he beat um, me last time? 18-1. I've got it tattooed on me. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that was exaggerated because I... Tried to I, get you a chance. I, I, I increased the, the risk option at the end. What was that, James? I said you tried <coughs> to give him a chance. <laughs> right, okay. So we're going to do a wee quiz. And this is not really about Celtic. It's just about world football in general. Um, there might mm -hmm. be a, a few questions I'm lacking, so I'm going to try and think in my feet as we go on. Um, so anyway, anyway, uh, Stephen, you're just on the water tonight. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Stalling some time, as you can as you can see. And the uh, James, I am on. Go. I'm on the Bally Girl. Bally Girl. Bally Girl. Uh, Stephen, out of curiosity, um, do you ever uh, pay attention to uh, the North of Ireland football? What do you mean, like the, like the football oh, things? Like, like Derry City and whatever. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, mm -hmm. Do you ever, are you ever aware of like the, the, the next big talent and if they might ever get snapped up by Celtic or you know, only like, can I see them go Well, to I mean, it's different. I, it's, I don't pay attention to the extent I know every player in the Irish League. I, I would... Look at Cliftonville, possibly. Um, there are players and stuff. Jim Magilton, do you remember him and his championship yeah. days from Ipswich? He, he, yeah, he, he, he manages them. 
and they've got a couple of young players. One recently went to West Ham. I think it was like Sean, Sean O'Hare or something like that anyway. But they've got a couple of decent players. Joe Gormley plays there. He used to play for St. Johnson in, in the SPL, I think nine games or something. Um, Ronan, Ronan Hale plays there. He played for Villa in his youth days. And he's back over across, back over here in Ireland, the game playing his football. So there is some decent talent going about. They know young players coming through. Absolutely not a clue. They go to some games sometimes, but not an avid follower of the, the Irish League. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay, fair enough. Right, okay, we're going to do a, a half ass quiz because that's how we do things um, on a, a Friday night. Um, so, why don't we? Yeah, okay, we'll do it. We'll do it. Question and answer. Right, so, question hold one. On, hold um... on two seconds, mate. Sorry, Stephen Butcher buzz on noise this week. <laughs> we're not oh, oh, fuck we're not doing that again. <laughs> you fucked me last time with that. <laughs> what, what was your buzzer uh, last time, James? Yeah, Mark Butchel was my buzzer Mark last Butchel, time. Mark <laughs> right, okay. Uh okay, so question one. Which year did Alex Ferguson take over at Manchester United? Nineteen eighty six. Mark Butchel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, one point to Stephen. Uh, question two: Which team did Barcelona sign David Villa from? Valencia. Question three: When Brazilian Ronaldo left Cruzeiro, his hometown club, PSV, to go to his first European team. What was it, James? What was that? PSV. PSV. Sorry, James. That was. Oh, sorry, 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 Stephen. That was such a labelled question that, that James was already in there. Um, <laughs> unprofessional. Unprofessional. Right. Okay. Which footballer has won the Champions League with Edgar David? <laughs> three different squads. Uh, three different teams. Karen Seedorf. <laughs> Wait. You sent him the link. There's no way. There's something going on here. It's mental. That's a fucking... Is the next answer fucking Andre Kinchowski? That's the most fucking... Ah, wow. Questionable. Oh, that one, I... Um, hold on. <laughs> These are textbook. I can tell up a kipper every time I'm doing this. I swear to fuck. Right, this player has played for these following clubs. Monaco, Barcelona... Henri. Oh, Arsenal, fuck. Falco. <laughs> Monaco, Say that Barcelona, again. who else? Monaco, Barcelona, Chelsea, Arsenal, and Como. Eh, uh, Fabregas. Yeah. Weirdly, who the Como. fuck's Como? Yeah, it was, I was going to say it was a Como one that gave me that, because he's an old like, player manager or owner or something like that. Or he's got something yeah. at like, boardroom level anyway. Yeah. Uh, James, I think if you were like a, a cowboy in a western, you'd be the first to draw. You, 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 <laughs> quick, quick off the mark. Um, okay, next question. What was memorable about what was memorable about Denmark's entry into the 1992 Euro Championships? Nope. Oh, what they weren't allowed in, but they got in for like uh, someone get disqualified. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh-huh. Stephen takes the point for that, brings it back to 4 2. And it happened to be Yugoslavia because a war broke out. I was out. going to say that. Yeah. That's okay. You get the point. Anyway, by the way, that Yugoslavia team would have been fucking fantastic if it wasn't for all the shit that happened in that region. Um, right. Okay. So, next question Which team won the European Cup the year after Celtic in 1960? Manchester United. Man United. Oh, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> I, think I, I think that's one each in on it. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, it's uh four three to James right now. Four three. Which Italian team is called the Rossoneri? AC Milan. Juventus. Fuck sick. <laughs> 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 Fucking Jamie, but see an Italian football shake. James knows it all. He has it on his wall. That's not fair. <laughs> that's, I've, I've got a fucking Italian dictionary up there. <laughs> <laughs> Which two teams can contested the 1960 European Cup at Hamden? Real Madrid, Fuck, Madrid, Madrid. Madrid. Fucking fucking. 
knows? I don't know. Real Madrid or Frankfurt? Boom! Steven. What? Are you joking? <laughs> Aye. I think no, it was 7-3. Uh, 7-3, no. I think it was, to, to Real Madrid in that game. You had the Stefano and Puskas play. Um, okay, I was so there. That is five four to James. Now, I've got one more question which I've written down. After that, I'm going to have to just. Oh, think about if Stephen gets it right, it's double points, eh? Well, well it, is one of those, it is one of those questions. Okay. So, how many English teams can you confidently name as winning the top league title since the the debut of the, the Premier League? So that's from 1992 onwards. How many of those teams can you confidently name? It's a five. Six. Up to you, up to you six. James. Stephen. I'll say six. Right, so Stephen, you're confident you can name six. James, you're confident you can name how many? It really is six, I think. Okay, okay. Um, so are both of us going for six? Both of you guys? Oh, no, there is needle seven. There's seven. There's seven. Seven. Stephen, Stephen. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Say eight and give me the point, Stephen. Go for it. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Seven. Right, so we'll both get seven here, yeah? Yeah. Right, okay. Um, Stephen, what's your seven? Newcastle. Nope. Blackburn. <laughs> Leicester, City, United. Ah, no way, I said it. Blackburn, Liverpool. <laughs> Fucking Newcastle, man. Oh, man. The Newcastle not won the league. I thought they did. No, that was the year they nearly won it. I, 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 would, have, I would have loved it. I would have loved it if Newcastle won. <laughs> Fucking wee bastards. Like, it's cheating bastards. <laughs> right. Okay. We're going to... We're... Right. That's... Um, <laughs> that's 6-4. 6-4 to, to James. So, uh -huh. I think we'll, we'll call it there. We'll call it there. Really, I it's 11-4, like... but who's counting? <laughs> and just JD to kind of hammer it home Newcastle never won anything ever I love the fact that that was your first answer as well <laughs> oh, no, I was so confident I was so confident <laughs> Monty here he's got Liverpool, Man U, Chelsea, Arsenal <laughs> Leicester, Man City and Blackburn you can't even forget Blackburn um, I I am um, Right, Leeds, they won it before the Premiership started. So, interestingly enough, they won it with Cantona back in, what, 1991. Then Cantona signed for Man U for £1 million, and then Man U won it in 1992. Aye, there you go. It's seven the total, aye? Is that everything? Aye, seven the total. Aye, because you, I always kind of think about it in like regions of like England. You've only got two London clubs who won it. You've got two Manchester clubs who won it. You've got one... Merseyside club who won it, and then you've got two kind of northern clubs, Leicester and Blackburn. Uh, that's quite a methodical way of thinking about it, but know, anyway, that's, that's easy way to remember it, isn't it? <laughs> indeed, indeed. Right, okay, so, um, what else have we got back to back to this weekend? Back to this weekend, uh, yeah, ooh, ner nerves in general, nerves, Stephen. Obviously, you make a kind of a big thing about it, you're coming over to the mainland, yes, and um. You can't you can't hide behind a couch. So, general, what's your optimism levels? Do you always look forward to these occasions? Do you ever get nervous about it? Or do you just kind of get drunk and forget about the, the result at the end of the day if it goes badly? <laughs> no, look, I always look forward to derby games, especially. And I watch them with a grandma usually, so I'm going over here for the first time for a derby game. Funny enough to, to watch it, but look, it is going to be a big occasion. I'm nervous, yes, but I'm also optimistic that, that we can win the, win the game and come away with three points. And I'm excited too to see everybody and have a laugh with them, have a couple of beers. It's a shame you guys can't make it, obviously, due to probably travel and things like that. But next time, of course, there's always next time. But yeah, I'm optimistic. But it's usually on the day of the game, I, my nerves properly kick in where I get like a rush of adrenaline and my hands are kind of shaking and you know, all that type of stuff. You're just watching. I don't like people speaking. don't like people talking when it's on. Just kind of fully... Really, focus but no that's not going to be the case on Sunday it'll be nuts to say the least but yeah I'm buzzing mm -hmm. James uh, where are you watching it? 
I just start peering, mate. I just want to chat here. I'm the same as Stephen. I, I don't like going out for it. You can't really sit and watch it and come full time. You're either jump my boot and you get your head kicked in if you're outside or you're going straight to your bed. So I'll just be up here watching it. Well, I've got the, the wee one. Um, she's only like what, 15 months old. So, you know, that, that's kind of my excuse not to, 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 to indulge too much in watching the game, you know. Um, but I think... Good distraction, you know, if I'm, anything. Good distraction. I know, I know. Even if I was on my own, I think I'd, I don't know if I'd be worse with it. I was thinking the chips aren't down, you know. I think the media narrative, that's another thing I was going to kind of ask you guys, what's your perception of the media narrative? I would have thought that Rangers are, are going to be edging it as favourites. Um, Stephen, are you okay with that prop? I'm, I'm a prop, man. It's all of yeah. us. <laughs> um, I just think that whenever the chips are down, I think that sometimes Celtic can actually do well at Ibrox. This time around, we've had a, a run of form. And we've got everybody back fit, apart from maybe Cal McGregor, touch and go. But with Brendan Rodgers at the helm, I do have kind of faith. And as much as my nerves, my, my, my gut is telling me that this is going to be horrible to watch, I've got a kind of funny feeling that it might not be as bad as what I feel. Um, so I guess that kind of brings us on to, James, what's your prediction and your lineup? Uh, for me, the team... As I say, it picks itself. Um, it's Scott Bain, um, no, it's Joe, Joe Hart, Johnson, Carter Vickers, Scales, Taylor, McGregor, Hitati O'Reilly, um, Kuhn, Kyogo, and Maida. If it's anything other than that, then it will be a lot for McGregor. But as I say, I, I fancy McGregor to start. Um, <laughs> I hate game predictions for these games. Um, I think there'll be goals. I don't think we'll keep a clean sheet, so I'll go. I'll go a three-two victory. Um, Stephen, three-three-two mm. victory. Okay, right, James. That that sounds like a that sounds a, a, a horrible um, game to to to, to, to endure. Um, we're going to concede two goals, but we're going to score three. Um, three, I don't three know. And we're, we're we're going to be three nothing. Three three nothing three, up. Yeah, three up. They'll score two goals in injury time. Okay, two Tavernier penalties here at the end. Yeah, that's it, aye. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> right, Stephen, one thing about the lineup that, that, that James said, he says it picks itself. So I'll get your thoughts about the, the about the midfield because that's probably the most contentious one. However, mm. do you think that the, the, the forward three picks itself, Kyogo, Kuhn and Maida, do you think every day that will always be a no, no doubts about that one? For now, it has to be. I think Coon's come on to a game. Kugel, <laughs> albeit he hasn't scored as much this season, he's always dangerous in these games. He's proved it before. And Mieta, we need him. He nullifies Tavernier. It, that's a tactic tactic more than anything, to be fair. But um, in, in terms of the lineup, I would go Joe Hart, Alistair Johnson, Carter Vickers, Scales, Taylor, Iwata, Rio and O'Reilly. I don't think McGregor, in my opinion, will be fit to start. Maybe people will say that's me just trying to throw enough shade against the wall as, and see if it sticks. But we'll never know. Sure. I'll, I'll go up top. Kuhn, uh, Kyogo, and Mieta. My score prediction, I'll stick to what I said in the predictor. 1-0. I think it will be a tight affair, but I do believe we'll be comfortable within the game. As I said, the caveat, if we play our best football, move the ball quick and not take our time and let them inv invite pressure onto ourselves. Uh, and we need to start really fast as well to get the crowd uh, quieting down because I know it's going to be and a crazy atmosphere for the, the orcs, as uh, Gav says. But yeah, that's where I'm, I'm sitting with that one at the minute. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, James, you are getting a wee bit of a. I know that's <laughs> fair, but I'll, I'll hold my hands up if I'm wrong. I've said that before. Oh, look, I'm not getting the bunting out for Kuhn just yet, but he's definitely come back, uh, come on to a game. Um, and he deserves his place. He's look, so did Yang, obviously. Um, he got his suspension. So does Forrest, arguably. Forrest has come on to a game any time mm. we've seen him. So look, I, I think I've had pot shots at every winger at the club um, at some point this season. But as yeah. it stands just now, um, I think in the wide areas especially, we're, we're really strong. And again, this is another week where we're going into a game and nobody at all has mentioned that the best winger in the club will be anywhere near the team. So it's a great option to have coming off the bench. 
Right, okay, so Stephen, you are starting um, in the midfield, uh, Rio Hitati, O'Reilly and Awata. Um, is yep. that only because because of the jeopardy of starting Rio and Cal McGregor, who both of them are maybe match-up, full fitness, 100%? That's the, the kind of the fear that you've got, and that's why you'd rather Awata. That's my only reason. My only reason. I need, I need legs and a athleticism in the middle of the park, and I can't be carrying two players who aren't one hundred percent fit. I said okay. I Selby can't. <laughs> no, 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 um, uh, no. I appreciate that perspective. Oh, so you would prefer Awata in Rio rather than say Callum McGregor and Bernardo? Obviously, you've got O'Reilly on both of those permutations. Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm going off form. Awata's been in the team the last couple of weeks. He, he's done well, obviously due to Callum Max injury. Rio's come back, and like James rightly said, he's played a bounce game in 60 minutes that um, the spaghetti had, so he has a bit of behind him. You could obviously caveat, like you said, Gav, could you start Cal Mack and Bernardo? You, you, you could, but then again, you can bring them on in the second half to do that job you would, would have wanted them to do in the first half as well, so there's flexibility within that kind of system. I would go personally again with uh, Hatate, Iwata, and O'Reilly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, as uh, Paul McFarlane says, uh, it's because oh, Stephen sorry. loves uh, because Stephen loves his H two O. That's why he loves the Iwata. Um, right. Okay. Well, I, I guess uh, another thing is it is a time for heroes, um, and it's a time for people to stand up. It's a time for Hun scalpers. James, your favourite Hun scalper of all time, and why? And who okay. do you think could be someone stepping up this time round? I, I don't know why, but I really, really fancy Matt O'Reilly to have a, a stormer on Sunday. Um, I, I think that we know he's going to move on in the summer. Um, and I think that MD that's scouting him, like I know the Atletico Madrid thing probably will still be there, but MD that's scouting him, these are the games we'll look at. And they're also at Ibrox as well. Um, obviously a hostile atmosphere and everything that comes with it. So, I don't know, I fancy him. I fancy him on Sunday to maybe get a goal or at least put in a man of the match performance. Um, aye, but in terms of your question, it's going to be Larson. Um, if that's the obvious answer, then... That is the obvious uh, answer. I was looking for originality. Please. Uh, it's shameful. I'll go, I'll go Dembele then. Dembele for this belly was here. Um, fairly bind. I mean, Gary Hooper as well. Gary Hooper scored what I think is one of the most underrated goals in a Celtic Rangers game. Mind it was it? I think the bet is three two at Ibrox. It was the game. Mind that El Kaduri scored. Fairly oh well. yes. Um, but Gary Hooper scored an absolute belter. Um, for the edge of the box, he just curls it round the goalkeeper, like passes it into the net. It was an absolute belter. So, I Dembele and Hooper. Okay, um, so Matt O'Reilly is going to be your man of the moment, you think, this time round. Um, all time, apart from Larson, of course. Um, it, it would be uh, Dembele, Dembele and Hooper, yes? Dembele and Hooper, aye. Yep. Okay, uh, Stephen, um, so again, a time for heroes. Um, yeah, uh, over to you. I'm going to grab a big straw basket and chuck all my eggs into it and say Nicholas Kuhn is going to stand up and be counted on Sunday, and I think he's going to have an absolute cracker of a game. Maybe, like you said, Gavin, a new hero in the books of Celtic Football Club. Who knows? But he's definitely coming on the game since he came in injured with his teeth and losing weight. So I'll say him. I'll go a bit left field to say Nicholas Kuhn. The, my favourite Hun scalper, I mean, Monty's on fire. Aaron Ramsey, Kevin Trapp. I mean, <laughs> you can't look past them. But if it was me, look, Lars is the obvious answer. James Stone, Dembele. I mean, Hans Scalper, we've got one, Kyogo, already in the team with his record against them. Um, Hans Scalper, who was in their heads, maybe not affecting the top end of the pitch, Scott Brown. Yeah. Oh, he, yeah. Was, he, was, he, he was there throughout all the success we had in, in, in the recent years and captain of the club, quadruple treble, was in Morelos' head, no end. <laughs> Just psychologically psychological, uh, bullied him, you know what I'm trying to say. Um, <laughs> I think I, yeah, I'm absolutely horrible pronouncing things, but Scott Brown, yeah, just captain, leader, legend, unbelievable player on and off the uh, unbelievable person off the park as well. From what you're led to believe, yeah, just him in that middle of the pitch. Joey Barton destroyed him. Anyone he came up against won that mental war first, and then won the won the the won it on the pitch after. Incredible mm-hmm. player. 
Um, I brilliant, brilliant answers, brilliant answers. I, I, I genuinely, really, I'm hoping that that Kuhn has a good game. I think it's we need him to have a good game. Uh, we know, we know that in these games we can't afford to have passengers, and uh, whenever you've got too many passengers in a team, then that's the reason that you can lose a game. Um, so Kuhn, I think Kuhn is going to go in with a bit of a lack of fear, and I love that. I think he, he said in his interview that. Look, I've already been at Bayern Munich. I've already been at Ajax, and I know that the the detractors the, the could say, "Well, you've not done it at those clubs." But yeah. he has been an employee of those clubs. He's he's understood the magnitude, the pressure of winning games all the time for those clubs with massive reputations, and you know the, the, the same kind of fashion follows you at Celtic. You know you have to win every single game. So I'm hoping that Kuhn goes in there with his first Glasgow derby, fearless. He's got raw pace, and I kind of compare him to Abada, whereas I always felt that Abada was like, fearful to use that raw pace that he had, whereas Kuhn, I think, is arrogant enough. He, he has that arrogance, which I think wingers need, and I think he, he's willing to kind of put his chips on the table and say, well, this is my pace, and I'm going to I'm going to race you to the byline, and I'm going to get an across, and you can stop me, but I'm going to, I'm going to try, I'm going to try, I'm going to try. And uh, I also like the fact that Kuhn was tracking back in the, the, the Livingston game as well, which really gives me confidence that he's kind of overcame his dental issue. Um, and he is is going to be a team player rather than, you know, an individual in the game. So I'm looking forward to that. I really, really hope that he stands up to the fore. Um, my personal favourite for the Hunt Scalpers was Alan Thompson every day of the week. Uh, Tomo get so many goals against them. Uh, a brilliant, brilliant goal against them at Ibrox when he cut in from the left flank and he scored it on his right peg. He took it past two particular players and he, he put it in the, the far corner. Um, a grass cutter, a daisy cutter, uh, a beautiful, beautiful goal. One particular memory I've got of Alan Thompson. So it was uh, for the Celtic and Rangers game where we, we won 1-0 and it was a, a Tomo, I think it was a free kick that he hit it off the underside of the bar, the parkhead. Now, me and my dad used to go to all the games, but I had a, a spare ticket for this particular game. And during the Martin O'Neill era, I'd, I'd saw a lot of victories against the um, Rangers. And I said to my friend, who'd never been to a Celtic and Rangers game if he wanted to go. So he was really, really looking forward to it. And I felt terrible for him because we're like, approaching 90 minutes and it's still nothing each. And like, I'd, I'd been spoiled with all these victories. And my mate had never seen this. And I'm like, oh, no, we're going to go away here. And it's just going to be a nothing each game. And right at the end, right at the end, Alan Thompson hit in a fantastic left peg dig. I think it was a free kick off the underside of the bar. And we won. And, you know, there was just limbs in the crowd. Everybody was going crazy. And I was just so grateful for my mate to actually appreciate that, which I'd already seen. I'd that already loved it. And I was just so happy for that because he could appreciate it. And I, I was just, you know, just just loving the experience for, for his benefit. Um, so that, that was one of my favourite games uh, for Alan Thompson to score. So I think he was one of the, the, the best hunt scalpers um, in, in my memory. And then... Um, hey, just, just, just to piggyback off the back of your question, um, what's your favourite goal against them? For me, uh, I, I'd be two. I'd be either Paul Lambert, the volley for the edge of the box, or Nakamura. Um, uh, the... You live in my head. That's what I was going to say, Nakamura. Uh, to be fair, it is one of the, the obvious ones, isn't it? Because it was a peach. Try to thank you for uh, are, we all about goal, are we all about gold for a significance or gold just for pure excellence? E- either or. Either or. That's a really um... good, good question. And James, those two... Go- Goals are obviously brilliant. Um, Patrick Larson's chip, JD Larson, Maestro Larson, <laughs> Paul McCalmont Larson. Yeah, yeah the, the Larson chip is probably like if you're going for a home scalper, you're going to go for Larson, and if you're right. going to go for the greatest goal, it's going to be that chip. But I, I guess you're trying to think of other ones because Larson what always was, takes what the was, top box. What was the game Carter Vickers scored in? Did it give us the lead again? Was that this season or last season? Last season, last season I think it was. In fact, no. Did you say that? Season of four, I think. It was just it's about two years ago, the new. You might be right. Did you say that, Han? 
big significance in the game. We went on to win that game, didn't we? That, that was a good goal for the time of the game that was anyway. Yeah, right. I think right. it was. for me, and it's bittersweet because we never won the league, but the, the Craig Bellamy goal at Ibrox whenever he turned Kyriakos inside out mm. and they fired a, a goal across the keeper, um, that was beautiful. Um, Wait, Sean Maloney, I know, Scott, kind of similar, no as good as the... Nah, the midweek goal. game. Aye, aye, against that. I think that was into Kloss, wasn't it, as well? He'd just yeah, come yeah, back uh-huh. or something. Yeah. Did Scott McDonald then score a volley against him? Scott McDonald scored a cracker at Ibrox, aye. Yeah, yeah. That was a good goal. Do you remember the goal that makes they scored? Um, it was back in the 90s, the early 90s, and it was an off the post. Um, it was a 2 0 game at Ibrox. Uh, a beautiful, beautiful goal. And I guess the, the John Collins free kick and off the post uh, when he was wearing the Predators for the first goal uh, with the Predators. Um, I, th- there's been a lot, but again, you're talking about aesthetically a great goal. Did we win the game? And did we win the league? You know, all those factors kind of come into account, you know, but we've all got great memories, you know, and it's, it's good. I think it's so a... Many- like that Nakamura goal was incredible. The, the movement on the ball, yeah. you always remember that. It was absolutely phenomenal. The, the Larson chip, like you said, it's the obvious answer because it's so iconic with the, with the whole commentary around that as well. Um, someone put in the comments, JD, what's the goalie doing, Tom? That was a cracker. You know, you, you think back to them types of things, and like you said, we all have fantastic memories of goals. And I was just thinking significance and Carver Vickers came in my head straight away for that for that game when he scored it from that corner kick. Was it was a good time to get a goal in that game? Obviously, we're on the win, but yeah, there's so many memories you could. Oh, well, they, absolute drag, crackers. Dragging the ass out this now, but what? No, in terms of result or just like whatever, but just in terms of your overall experience, what's your your kind of favourite victory against them? Well, I think nothing probably would eclipse the six-two game at Parkhead. But the reason I would go to something else is because it was the first of its kind in my lifetime. And it was the, the 5 1 game um, under Venglos, uh, where Nakamura scored the two, sorry, um, Maravchik scored the two goals. Mm. And he kind of looked around as if, like, oh my God, everybody's going crazy. What's what's the big deal? Larson, I think, got two, and I think Botcher got one. That was a 5 1 game. And it was just kind of significant that we could actually lay a glove on them, not even just lay a glove, we could humiliate them. Right. And I guess it was a slow turning of the tide at the end of the 90s as a, a sign of things to come. So I think that, for me, that was perhaps one of my, my favourite ever uh, derbies that I was I was a part of. The 6-2 game eclipses that for for atmosphere and for, for joy in the fact that we won the league. But the five one game had its own merits as well, and that's probably the most memorable for me. I think one of the adding on to what you said, Gavin, the Georgia Samras dead eyebrows. Mm-hmm. I was at that game. That uh, unbelievable. Jeez, oh that guy took them to school. Um one of the most favorite games I've ever watched would have been the, the first Glasgow Derby game when when they climbed the leagues and they were saying we're coming. And we uh, spanked them apart. That we hung out the flag of war that day. That sticks in my mind. Um, and so, you're trying to think. Uh, what was the game we won? Was it the League Cup? We won extra time against them. McGeady scored. Aye, yeah. aye. Yeah, that was a cracking game as well. But Did Darno D you, score that day as well? Yeah, Darno D yeah. scored. Two Irish players. Two Irish players scored that day. Um, there's so many iconic games. What, what about you, James? You're asking the questions, but what about you? Eh. Uh, I'd go to the three nothing game with Hitati's double. Um February and, one. Aye, aye. Uh, yeah. and weirdly enough, the two each game, see the Bruni game at yeah. Ibrooks. Um that was another one I was lucky enough to get tickets. So uh, me and my dad went and after the game, uh we were walking back to the supporters bus and your phone's gonna have it's not and it's all these pictures of the Bruni and I'm that's Somebody's photoshopped this. We didn't have a clue. Didn't know until we get back to the pub and seen it on Sky or whatnot, but didn't have a clue. But I, with a, with a day that was going down to 10 men. Uh, by the way, the one from Monte, that was probably the, oh, the, worst, yeah. the, the worst one from like a, oh. a coronary point of view in terms of the impact on the heart, the Julian uh, Cup Mate, final. 
I feel as if the injury time in that game finished like two minutes ago. That's how long that game was, <laughs> yes, honestly. Yes, yes, yes. It oh. does. Uh, it took years off everybody's life, I'm sure. Oh, mental. And th- how, how bad did you feel for Frimpong, you know, um, who had a, a ma- magnificent performance and then obviously get red carded and then in his interview at the end of it, he's like, oh my days, oh my days. <laughs> <laughs> what a guy Frimpong is, by the way. Um, yeah. here. What a right back he's turned out to be. Incredible. Well, people keep talking about that, 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 that windfall that we're going to get from that eventual transfer. Uh, I don't know if it's going to happen, but the, with the, the news that Xavi Alonso is going to stay on for another year at uh, Leverkusen, it might mean that another year of, uh, of Frimpong in Germany again. And we, we might not see that. He's, he's, he's at least mid-20s by now, I'm sure. Is this the like the windfall Rangers are meant to get from a player that wasn't even there, Tillman? <laughs> Paramedic, <laughs> you know, incredible. Okay. But I think we actually do. I think we actually do have a clause in Frimpong's okay. contract, fifteen percent, maybe or whatever. But it won't be, won't be mad. You know, people use words like windfall, bumper, and cash, and you know all this type of stuff. Does it dramatize it like you did at the start of the podcast, Gav, with your language? You know what I mean, that's what they do. But really, really, it's the six six mil. It's not huge money in today's market. Look, like. look forward to Gordon Strang spending it next season. <laughs> you know what I mean? Don't see that. Such a pessimist. Oh my god! Such a pessimist. Um. Right. Okay. So where are we? Um. Okay. So we've done a lineup. We've done our predictions. Um. We're about an hour and almost forty minutes in. Uh. Is there anything else to to to, to say? I, I think I, I thought of something, but I've forgotten it. Um, well, I'm going to throw one in, right? I'm going to roll it up into a ball, and I'll chuck it at James first since he asked us a few questions. I don't know if you've seen it. Kieran Tierney's obviously lined up to do an interview um, for Sky Sports to do with a Celtic game, but wee bits of snippets have come out in different quotes and that, talking about Rogers and Cal Mack being instrumental and Rogers having the experience. But there was talk at the start of the season about Kieran Tierney coming back. He's went the real saucy dad. Looks like he's playing week in, week out, still plagued by a lot of injuries, but just a simple one. Would you take him back? Uh, I, 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 but we're a big, massive but. He's a, obviously, he's a brilliant player, but he's now going to be on kind of funny money to us. Um, and then you've got reliability issues. Do you want to pay that much money for somebody that might miss quite a lot of games? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I really. That's a, that's a good question. To be fair, because he, he, he's a massive upgrade in Taylor. Of course, he is um, Scotland's best left back. In my, my opinion, um, maybe I say die, but maybe it'd be better to look elsewhere for the money it cost. Yeah, I think it's a sentimentality thing that Celtic always have being attracted to the former player or former manager. And even in the comments here, there's, I'd say, 60% majority at the moment anyway saying they wouldn't take him back, Gavin. It's quite surprising. Obviously, we know he's class. He's probably world class. He played for Arsenal, had an injury setback. Many people blame Celtic for it as well in terms of overplaying him and overusing him in his younger years, which we probably did in his hip flexors and all went. But he's over in Spain and he said he has a new lease of life and he actually said he supports Real, Real Sociedad now, which again is lip service to their supporters, blah, blah, blah. But would you have him back at, at Celtic Football Club? Ah, uh, yes. I, I don't know, I don't know. Um, the, the thing is, if he's going to be fit for half a season, 40% of a season, then that's going to be a void. And we, we talk about like Greg Taylor not being good enough for Celtic in a, a, a European capacity and the fact that we want to upgrade upon that. Kieran Tierney is that upgrade, but what good is that if he's only going to be available for half the games, maybe not even half the games? And I think that Arsenal were right to get rid of him um, because of their style of play. Um, they, they needed a, a two-footed player. Um, and the other thing is that he's, he's a £25 million player on his day, but he doesn't have those days consecutively, you know, a lot of the time he is injured. As I think it's tragic for Tierney. And 
because of, because of his injury record. I think it's so so tragic for him. And no, I think because of his track record with injuries, then it wouldn't serve us in the long term. Um, I don't know if bad. anyone's picked up on that. Ram on yeah, it. He's yeah. a Celtic blog, blogger, podcaster, and he, he does it from his room, but it looks identical to your room. I'm only getting that now. That's fantastic, <laughs> Paddy. That's unbelievable. Unbelievable. But no, the, the, the tyranny thing's interesting. I mean, I think I said a year or so ago back on the podcast, I wouldn't have him back, mainly due to his injuries, and you're paying a, probably a record wage for someone who's going to be on an injury table. While he was with us, he was unbelievable, and he got that great move to Arsenal for playing him, but that's Done and dusted, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Do you think that Celtic are too guilty of, I, I don't know if the phrase is continualism, of like going back to people who have we've worked with before, like Brendan Rodgers, Neil Lennon, um, I, I guess we've done it with players as well. Uh, <coughs> do you think that we're Isn't too afraid of trying something new? It never really works out second time round, by and large. Um Hopefully it does this time with Rogers. Um but by and large it, it doesn't really ever work out second time round. Yeah, it's a good point. It's a good point. Normally, I totally agree. Normally the first spell is always the best and the second is a a, a, a appeal comparison, you know. I think of like Frank McIverney and Charlie Nicholas coming back to the strikers back in the early nineties where we, we needed, you know, quality players and you know the door had kind of seen their heyday. Um, so well, I, I mean, the, the, the evidence, the evidence is they're playing to see even the border level. Fuck me, Gordon Strachan, Craig Strachan. Do you know what I mean it's, it's Gavin Strachan, Peter Lowell, Mark Lowell? It's constantly going back to the same well and looking and picking up the same people. Get a grip and look forward and make actually decisions for Celtic that benefit them in, in the longer term instead of going back to just players who've been with us before and the romantic side of things would be unbelievable to have them back, blah, blah, blah. You can sell shirts and all this crap. I get that. Don't get me wrong. I get all that merchandise sales and bringing players in for the, the sentimentality issue, but nah, it's not for me. Never has been. I mean, it's would one take, of them things. And... Would you take Frimpong back? No. He would have come <laughs> back in a million years. I'm just saying that because it flies in the face of everything we've just said. <laughs> That's different. Frimpong's Prove that he can hang. I mean, nah, he, he's nah. Van Dijk he's different. But they touch him. <laughs> Gav, don't Gav take your mind out of the gutter, chief. That's not that's not good. No, I, I just meant like hang like, like basketball, and I don't think he's tall enough to slam dunk. Um, Frimpong, I think he's he's the height of shit. You know, um, he's he's a great great footballer, really really fast, but I don't think he's tall enough to play basketball, Stephen. This is a great point, John. Would you go back with your ex? No chance. You move on. That's it. I'm married, so. <laughs> Just so why you went? <laughs> yes, yes. I don't know why I've done that. I don't know. Miss your calling as a cheerleader, probably. Um, <laughs> aye, okay. Uh, Stephen, what time is uh, your ferry at tomorrow? Jesus, do you want people to jump on with me and hold my hand? <laughs> I'm only joking. Oh, it's, 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 it's not like the R- RUC is going to pick you up at the docks. Come on. <laughs> it's um just a bit before eight and just a bit after seven, in between. <laughs> 50 dead men walking here, can I? <laughs> it's, I'm only joking. It's at half seven, so it is. It's a half seven. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, okay. Well, uh, I hope your, your handler picks you up. Um, oh, I'm here. I'm no state tight, dude. Trust me on that one. <laughs> right. right, okay. Um, what else we got to do before we conclude for tonight? We've been on for one hour and 45 minutes. Thoroughly enjoyed that. And by the way, to everybody in the comments, Thank you for all your, your comments. Hit that like button if you haven't done so already. And please subscribe. Uh, you might win a prize. You probably won't win a prize. There is no prize. You might win a prize. You might win a prize. I don't know. You might. You might. Right. Stephen might bring you back some seaweed from the Irish Sea. I have bananas. I mean, you know. Irish bananas. Well, I, I don't actually know. I think they're from Costa Rica on the on the... 
Colombia. They're Colombian bananas. They're, you know what they're laced with, don't you? That's mental. Who buys bananas from Colombia? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right, anyway, we're too potato today. So we'll probably wrap it up from now. Um, right, okay, so Stephen, you're watching it, Graces. I hope you have a fantastic time. Uh, win, lose, or draw, and get back home safely. Um, James, you're obviously watching it in the space shuttle. So just uh, just, just keep it here. Godspeed. We made progress tonight for a, what was it, a space shuttle and then deep sea world, so at least we're on to our room now, so we're making progress. <laughs> yeah. And I'll be watching the game, I'll be like, you know, I'll be with my little 15 month old daughter, so she might be wanting to watch like uh, Miss Rachel on Netflix, but no, the game will be on, but I'm kind of grateful for that distraction. I think I might need it. Mm. Um but if we score, then I'm, I'm going to terrorise. I'm going to be like shouting, you know. And she won't. You got to terrorise her. Jesus Christ! <laughs> That's the best she, I've ever heard. It's just unfair, you know. If I start shouting and she doesn't know what's going on, she's going to start crying. Um, she might have to get used to it. Hey, anyway, anyway, <laughs> Gav will be throwing the wind through the ceiling. I hope not. <laughs> That's cool. Fashion room. It's fashion room. Right, okay. Um right, we'll conclude. We'll be back on Monday, I guess. Monday for um unless we do yeah. a match review, but don't count on it. Monday we'll be back. No, it's not happening, Gav. Nah, nah, we'll all be <laughs> hungover. We'll all be hungover. Um Stephen, what have you learned tonight? What have I learned tonight? Ah uh, that my bananas are from Colombia. That Carl McGregor might be fit. That you are going to terrorize your daughter of Celtic score. And I'm looking forward to a journey tomorrow, which is probably going to be the most choppy thing I've ever been in my life. But sure, mm-hmm. all for the greater good. I've learned that if you're a female football coach, you shouldn't push your male counterpart and accuse him of male aggression. I think that's a bad move. Um, oh, James. Uh- I, well, I'll wait to see what Ali McCoy says on that. Um, but I'm, um, I learned that fucking croissants are linked to the world. Oh world. yes, look at what you said there. Austria, yeah, yeah. The the Austrian Hungarian Empire defeated the Ottoman Empire. I'm sure many years ago, and that's. Why it feels awesome. like you had that on cue. It's crazy. It feels like you're reading that. That's how quick you were. Full of useless, useless facts. I hope it's a fact. Otherwise, I'm just going to be a useless person. Right. Anyway, uh, 10 out of 10, guys. Thank you, Stephen Kennedy. Thank you to everybody. Uh, great show, lads. Uh, thank you so, so much, Paul McCallman. Thank you again. Um, guys, have a great weekend. Have a fantastic Sunday. I hope you do. Um, aye. As Stephen said, keep safe. Keep safe. Get mad with it. Um, fucking love you guys. Brilliant. We'll be back in Monday, okay? So... End of days, end of days. Bye bye, bye bye. End stream. Awkward uh, outro. Bye bye. <laughs> Why do you always do this? I don't...